Oh, I'm Warren Hoag, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this policy forum on Beyond Coney 2012, Protecting Children from the Lord's Resistance Army. Co-sponsored by IPI, the Permanent Mission of Germany to the United Nations, and the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict. Over the past year, unprecedented attention has been devoted to the Lord's Resistance Army and its campaigns of abduction, killing, maiming, sexual violence, and forced recruitment of people, many of them children. Among the developments are an African Union-led regional cooperation initiative against the LRA that has been launched following decisions by the AU Peace and Security Council and the UN Security Council. Deployment by the United States of some 100 military advisors to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Uganda to assist the region's military forces in killing or capturing the LRA leader Joseph Kony and his senior command. And finally, the Invisible Children Kony 2012 video, both part one and part two, both of which or excuse me, which have both mobilized worldwide attention, but also raised many questions about what approach to take to combat the LRA's influence and actions. Uh, I checked this morning and saw that the YouTube version of Coney 2012 has now been viewed 90,673,026 times. We are holding this meeting today on the occasion of the publication of the Secretary General's report on children affected by the Lord's Resistance Army, and we've assembled a particularly knowing group to discuss the subject at this critical moment. You have their full biographies in your papers, so let me introduce them just briefly here in the order in which they will speak. Uh, offering opening remarks will be Peter Wittig, who since December of 2009 has been the permanent representative of Germany to the UN. He currently represents Germany on the Security Council and serves as president of the UN Peacebuilding Commission. He also chairs the Security Council Working Group on Children and Armed Conflict. Radhika Kumaraswamy is Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict, a post she took up in April 2006. Prior to that, she was Chairperson of the Sri Lanka Human Rights Commission and Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. Grace Akalo is a former child soldier from northern Uganda and co-author of Girl Soldier, a story of hope for northern Uganda's children. She is the co-founder of United Africans for Women and Children's Rights. Michael Poffenberger has been the executive director of Resolve, since 2007 and oversees the organization's research and advocacy focused on bringing an end to the atrocities of the Lord's Resistance Army and on supporting recovery for affected communities across Central and East Africa. And finally, Adonia Ayabari is the Deputy Permanent Representative and Chargé d'Affaires of Uganda to the UN. Prior to that, he was here at IPI as the director of our Africa program, where his responsibilities included facilitating a 10-year program of action for the UN to strengthen the capacity of the African Union in the management and resolution of conflict. So let me begin by inviting Ambassador Wittig to take the floor. Thank you, Warren. It's a pleasure to be here at IPI, and many thanks to IPI for hosting this important uh, panel discussion on the LRA, LRA, and especially thanks for giving me the floor so early to make some brief remarks in my capacity as uh, chair of the working group of the Security Council on Children and Armed Conflict. The LRA atrocities uh, have been shocking and appalling uh, the whole world, and with those 90 million of people who saw the YouTube video, um, the global citizens now know about uh, the LRA and its atrocities. And that's a tremendous asset that this uh, YouTube video has accomplished. LRA has now become 
synonymous with the brutal abduction and use of children as child soldiers, porters, spies, or sex slaves. Probably thousands uh, of children have been killed by the LRA, and over the years, and tens of thousands are uh, displaced. Uh, the LRA has been listed uh, in the list of shame in the annual uh, reports of uh, the Children in Armed Conflict uh, reporting system of the Secretary General over the last nine years. Now, there is a huge gap between the awareness um, of the crimes that the LRA uh, committed and the effective action. Now, I'm not claiming that we in this working group can actually bridge uh, that, that gap, but um, I just want to let you know uh, how we approach the LRA issue in the Security Council and what we an intend to do. Since 2006, the Security Council Working Group has repeatedly the, addressed the LRA issue and, as I said, will continue to do th so this year. Only some days ago, uh, as Warren just mentioned, the Secretary General has issued a new report uh, on the situation of children in armed conflict affected by the LRA. The Security Council, in the form of that working group on children in armed conflict, will take up the report and, and formulate uh, conclusions, recommendations, uh, that it submits to the member states of, of the UN. And I, as I see it, we should focus on the following elements. We should build upon the UN regional strategy to be developed in support of the African Union Regional Initiative. That's very important to have a linkage between the UN and the African Union. We should demand that all military efforts to address the LRA threat put the protection of those children currently being associated with the LRA very much front and center. We should call on military actors to ensure the safe and adequate handover of the children associated with the LRA uh, to civilian uh, child protection advisors. That's a challenge. And we should call for renewed uh, efforts to combat impunity for LRA perpetrators of grave violations against children. That's, of course, one of the key elements uh, of the action that needs to follow combat impunity. The LRA has demonstrated its ability to mount operations across borders massively. Despite the present state of uh, uh, weakness, it has been uh, 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 suffering some blows in, in the leadership. Uh, the LRA is still capable of instilling fear and violence in the region, mostly uh, affecting children. So this is why it's so important to address the LRA threat I hope that our discussion uh, today will contribute to the efforts to develop a comprehensive uh, approach in order to tackle this regional security uh, challenge. Once again, Warren, a uh, great thing that you organized this panel, and I'm looking forward to listening to all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for that uh, send off. We're going to move right now to our first speaker, uh, who is on my right, Radhika Kumaraswamy. Thank you very much. I want to thank the International Peace Institute and the Permanent Mission of Germany for co-hosting co this uh, meeting uh, uh, in this very timely event with us. Um, I must say I'm very grateful for the unprecedented attention which has been devoted to the LRA in the last uh, year and which has triggered action by member states and the international community as a whole. Um, I'm hopeful that these initiatives will actually yield results for children on the ground, for especially those children caught up uh, by the LRA. As you know, the uh, Secretary General released his first report on the situation of children affected by the LRA uh, just last week, uh, and I thought I would just take this opportunity uh, to perhaps set the uh, stage for the discussion by giving you some of the key findings uh, of that report. Um, and what the Secretary General did in those findings is look at the trends in the violations, as well as the measures taken by the United Nations and partners, as well as the remaining challenges that face us. Now, if we look at the first issue, which is the violations that have committed, been committed by the LRA, as you know, for nine years, since 2003, 
the LRA has been on the Secretary General's what we call the list of shames or the annexes to the report on children in armed conflict as one of the most persistent perpetrators of grave violations against children, especially for the recruitment and use of children. Uh, from July 2009, over a period of just over two years and a half, the abduction and recruitment of 591 children, 268 girls and 323 boys has been documented by the UN in the Central African Republic the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. It is likely that the actual figure of abductions and recruitment is much higher, given the difficulty of tracking the information on every single incident involving the LRA. These children are used in various roles. Some serve as combatants or as human shields, others as spies, guards, porters, and cooks. Children are forced to kill their friends or other children in the armed group and are given so-called magical potions from their leaders. The girls and boys are told that these potions will increase their physical capacities and make it possible to trace and re-abduct them if they escape. Now, I must say there's been a new trend over the last year with regard to the LRA, which may be due to the fact that they, um, uh, this is because of the security situation. Over the past year, it appears that the LRA has begun to abduct children for only a short period, using them primarily as porters or as accomplices in the looting and pillage of food and medicine. They are then released. This is so that they would not be a burden on the group. And this suggests that the group may be in survival mode. Now, with regard to sexual violence, there continues to be a systematic characteristic of LRA modus operandi. Almost all girls mentioned in the report were subjected to repeated sexual violence and forcibly married to combatants. Uh, it is common for the girls escaping the LRA to return with babies conceived from this rape. These girls returning are very stigmatized and are sometimes even rejected by their communities. With regard to killing and maiming of children, another grave violation, 45 cases of killing and 39 cases of maiming of children by the LRA mainly conducted during the LRA attacks against children were documented from 2009 to early 2012. Children while in captivity were also killed for attempting to escape or defying orders, as well as to due to illness and malnutrition. Now I must say again, the trend, the number of children killed and maimed seems to have declined during the reporting period, which might be explained by the ongoing military operations protection efforts by the UN peacekeeping missions in Congo and South Sudan, the massive displacement of civilians fleeing the LRA threat, and the presence of local self-defense groups. With regard to attacks on schools and hospitals, the trend is in the early days, attacks against schools and hospitals were initially part of the group's tactic, at least in the Congo, but the LRA is no longer directly targeting schools and hospitals. However, LRA activities commonly keep thousands of children from attending school due to the fear of the attacks. Now, given these violations, what has been the protection response of the international community? At the regional and international um, efforts, I think I'm encouraged by the multiple efforts underway, including the development of more coordinated approaches. As you know, originally, it was only the UPDF, the Ugandan Army, which conducted the military operations. But today, there is the establishment of the African Union Regional Cooperation Initiative, uh, the development of a joint UN-AU regional strategy, and the US's LRA Disarmament in Northern Uganda Recovery Act. So these are some of the coordinated approaches that are taking place at the international and regional efforts. With regard to the UN, there is better attempt to better cross uh, for more cross-border coordination on child protection. As you know, the LRA question requires a very tight cross-border coordination on these issues. In terms of our issue, child protection, a regional UN focal point system was established in 2009. This focal point system, including staff from Uganda, DRC, Khan, and South Sudan, has two primary roles to ensure that children are repatriated and reintegrated in a timely manner and that information is also shared, and to also monitor and report on the grave violations. And this recent Secretary General's report was based on that monitoring and reporting. There is also UN reintegration efforts. To date, over 
2,000 children separated from the LRA have been given assistance. Over the past three years, several hundred children were separated from the LRA, repatriated and reintegrated back into their community. With the aid of UNICEF, the Italian NGO Kupi, and other child protection partners. Children are provided with interim care, they're provided with counseling and family reunification assistance, and depending on their age, vocational training. In the GRC, we also have the situation where many of the children self-integrate. So the UN is attempt to, trying to attempt to identify these children and to provide them with that kind of reintegration and appropriate assistance. As you know, peacekeeping efforts of the UN on this in Oule and Baule districts in the DRC, 1,200 United Nations troops conduct day and night patrols, including market escorts to better protect the children uh, as well as the civilians. MONUSCO also uses its large radio network to encourage LRA combatants to defect and join the mission's DDR process. Uh, this is also done through leaflets. Now, with regard to the overall situation, uh, with regard to the LRA, I think due to these protection act activities as well as military activities, there is no doubt that the LRA has been weakened. It is scattered. But it continues to have the capacity to make random attacks, and therefore it casts a long shadow in CAR, DRC, and South Sudan. And so finally, what are the challenges that remain? I would just like to highlight the following. First, we feel that all military efforts, and this is also regard to the Kony um, video, et cetera, that encourage these military efforts, must place protection of civilians as the front and center. With the AU Regional Task Force now headquartered in Yambio, it is my hope that operation guidelines are made to make sure that protection of civilians is mainstreamed. We must remember that large numbers of the LRA combatants are children. So training on child protection for these troops that are going after the LRA is absolutely crucial. We also managed uh, to work with the Ugandan Armed Forces in establishing standard operating procedures for the reception and handover LR of our LRA children. We hope that with all these other armed groups, armed forces joining this operation, that this, these standard operating procedures will also be applied. Secondly, with regard to, finally, with regard to amnesty for, um, uh, for LRA combatants, we, we feel uh, that defections, of course, are necessary, but we must ensure that there is no impunity for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, and adult LRA combatants, especially those who occupy command position and bear the greatest responsibility, must be held responsible. But of course, children with regard to the uh, LRA should not be prosecuted for crimes. I'm also concerned about the creation of self-defense groups in the border regions of the Central African Republic uh, and the South Sudan, where state security forces are not present, and uh, the fact that some of them may also be recruiting children. Finally, I must say, I have visited with most of the areas affected by the LRA, Gulu at one time, Dungu in the DRC, Yambio in South Sudan, and Obo in the Central African Republic, and met with UN peacekeepers in the UPDF, the protection NGOs, and most importantly, the children. Everyone who meets these children associated with LRA immediately notices that their eyes are completely blank and their responses both vulnerable and, and unusual because of the horrendous experiences they have undergone. Grace Okello, who is with us today, is a testament to the fact that there is a life after the LRA and with the proper care and assistance, children can recover and become leaders in the field. We must therefore make a commitment to these children, for in my whole experience as SRSG on CAC, the suffering the children who are associated with LRA undergo is probably the worst experience in the world. We cannot sit back and remain silent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you for uh, mentioning at the end our next speaker. We are. Uh, please, indeed, honored to have Grace Akalo here speaking to us. Uh, Grace, it's all yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am so honored to be here today. Um, it is a great joy that this day is dedicated to actually talking about the man who destroys the lives of many, many thousands of children. The man who was thought to be a myth in my own country, 
a man who was thought to be a myth among the children who were abducted. That's Joseph Coney that formed the LRA group today. I just want to say thank you to uh, the SRSG, Mrs. Kumaraswamy, for the dedicated work that she's done uh, for the children in armed, armed conflict. She has put a face for us, a face that was not seen is now seen. A name that was not heard can now be heard. And all the, um, the panelists here today um, for discussing this issue, because it's very important. When I was abducted, this was a question which was in my mind. Where is everybody to protect me? Where is everybody to protect all these children? On that night of October 1996, uh, actually our um, Independence Day, ours became Slavery Day. When people were celebrating uh, independence, ours was slavery. When Joseph Coney sent it, his groups to uh, St. Mary's College Aboke and abducted 139 girls, and took us into captivity. And the terrors that we are subjected to, no human being ever should go through. The LRA subject you to beating, brainwashing, and the brainwashing is not just telling you things, but threats of death. There's nothing else but threat of, threats of death. And it's not just a threat, but it was real. They kill you, or they kill people in front of you, or they force you to kill another person so that you don't think of escape or you don't think of committing anything against the LRA itself. The atrocities that children were forced to go and commit to villages to abduct more children is none other than I could call evil, pure evil that the LRA was doing in northern Uganda. And I, I was so sudden that the, the same LRA actually crossed the border to go to Congo because Congo have children, Congo have women, Congo have people. And to commit the same atrocities that they committed in northern Uganda would be unheard of. It would be heartbreaking to see that they're committing such atrocities. I would be very glad if Kony one day will be captured, whether dead or alive, I don't care, because it's evil. I do not seek revenge. I don't like revenge. But in this case, the LRA, whether Joseph Kony is captured dead or alive, I don't care. And I'm very glad that all the people in this room, all the excellencies, all the attentions are focused to rescuing children, to protecting these children, and to actually stop the LRA from what they're doing. It is very, um, it is very disheartening that in the previous years, the LRA were allowed to move and abduct children. The LRA were allowed to go even when the people moved from, the camp, from their homes to the camp, they were allowed and they went and killed people in the camp, burning people in the camp. It is disheartening that the LRA actually were allowed to make children walk from camps to, to the cities to sleep because they were afraid. They were trying to protect themselves. But it's of uh, great news that today that is changing because dif a difference is being made. The US soldiers, 100 soldiers, has been sent into Uganda. The AU, as Mrs. Kumaraswamy, the SRSG reported, is, being, is involved. The UN is involved. I wish that was before, but better late than never. Better late than never that we rescue these children. Better late than never that we capture Joseph Kony. Better late than never that we stop the rape that goes on with the LRA abducting girls and f subjecting them to rape. But Kony, 20, uh, Kony, we say this event is after Kony, what next? Because I think what next is very important. The abduction of children, thousands of children in northern Uganda, 
has left a great hole that will be felt for generations. Joseph Kony going to Congo, Central Republic of Africa, going to Southern Sudan, is going to leave a great deep hole that can never be repaired if we just look and capture Kony, put him in a weather jail, and say, okay, all is done. A great damage has been done. Thousands of child soldiers in Uganda, more than 30,000 children were abducted. In Uganda, a half of those children were girls. In Uganda, a half of those children who were girls came back with children, came back with, uh, 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 with diseases, HIV affected, that they were not supposed to have. A half of or all of those children are going to be citizens or they are citizens of Uganda. They're going to be leaders of Uganda. They're going to be the mothers that protect or that uh, teach the children. How are they going to do that? What is the generation going to look like, a new generation? Who is going to be blamed for if anything else happens? It, the blame will fall on all of us because the protection lies on each an individual and each and all the organizations and all the countries and everybody that is human to protect another human being. But this also is a matter of security. It's not just about Uganda, Congo, or the Central Republic of Africa or Sudan, but this concerns the whole world because these children are going to move these children are going to be, as the world has become, intertwined. They're not going to sit in one place. They're going to be adults. And with those wounds in their heart, the security we are trying to fight for now might be a different case if we do not act and actually reintegrate and provide services for these children to go back and actually reconcile with themselves and reconcile with the community as well. And these actions of Joseph Kony should be stopped for, for once and for all. Because if not, one of these children might come up and say, if I don't have anything, I was not protected, I was not given services, I was not, all these questions. They can go back and start a new LRA, which might be even worse because they had had wounds. I'm glad, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that the discussion of LRA today will mark the end of the LRA, will mark the peace of Northern Uganda, the peace of Congo, the peace of Southern Sudan, the peace of Congo, Eastern Congo, but also will mark the peace of mind and justice for the children who have been abducted by the, by the LRA. Thank you. Grace, those are inspiring words. Um, and thank you for bringing that testimony to us. Thank you in particular for describing the universality of this problem. You have laid before us, those of us that think of ourselves as the international community, uh, the real challenge of this, which goes way beyond uh, the region, what's happening in the countries you named, and it involves all of us, and I think all of us feel more deeply involved now for your testimony, so thank you for that. Um, Michael uh, Poffenberger, would you yeah. please? <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah, first, just to say, again, thank you to, to Grace. I don't know that um, uh, the children and, and women who are still in the bush could ask for a better advocate on their behalf. Uh, and um, uh, I think your story is a good reminder that nothing that we can discuss here today is, is going to be enough until it actually succeeds. And that's the standard we should be setting uh, for ourselves. Um, so our organization, Resolve, um, and thank you, too, to uh, Ms. Kumar Swami into the hosts uh, today for this, uh, for this event. Uh, our organization Resolve is a policy partner in the Kony 2012 campaign. So uh, we didn't, uh, weren't the ones that made the video. Uh, so questions about how exactly it's been viewed by 90 million people on YouTube, I would defer to uh, my colleagues at Invisible Children. Um, 
but it's encouraging to be here because the point of the campaign, um, contrary to some popular belief, was not just to make Coney famous for its own sake. Um, so that high school and college kids could change their profile pictures and update their statuses on Facebook and Twitter. Um, but actually to, uh, uh, to spark the, exactly the kind of dialogue that's existing today and the kind of action that it's going to be needed to, to see an end to this problem. Um, uh, we look forward to being back here actually at the end of the month uh, with some activists, uh, human rights activists from Congo and Central African Republic. Um, uh, and we'll be doing a media event uh, when the UN uh, Security Council meets to finalize the, the upcoming UN AU strategy. Um, it's very encouraging. So, yeah, just to comment again on, on some of what's already been said, uh, to affirm first that, that things have been moving in the right direction on the international scale. Um, uh, Kony and the LRA um, can't be understood if you try to apply um, uh, a political objective to their activities. Uh, they can be understood best by, under, by, by knowing that their operations right now are just geared to their own survival. And to survive, they target the communities that are in the most vulnerable, most remote, and in fact, most marginalized areas of each of these three countries, where uh, mobilizing a response from, from regional governments and the international communities is not only incredibly difficult due to the lack of very basic infrastructure and tools, um, but also not uh, at the top of anybody's priority list in the region, uh, let alone the rest of the world. Um, so the uh, initiatives that are underway, ranging from uh, the work that uh, Ms. Kumaraswamy is doing to the upcoming launch of the UN-AU strategy to the AU's own military cooperation initiative, and the work that we've been most focused on in the U.S. side uh, in terms of the president's strategy and the deployment of advisors, uh, is all good in that it represents a very comprehensive uh, approach on paper to dealing with the LRA, because anybody who's worked on this problem knows that um, uh, while uh, it's a very simple one to communicate why this is so bad, it's not a simple problem to solve. Um, um, but there are signs that this uh, movement has started to work. Um, the last report that we got, uh, when Kony last convened his senior commanders, uh, in Central African Republic in late 2011 was that um, uh, he ordered a, a drawdown actually in the numbers of large-scale attacks and killings and abductions um, because he was aware that he was under much greater international scrutiny than has been the case uh, in recent years and that large-scale killings and abductions draw more unwanted attention to the activities that he's uh, uh, been perpetrating uh, and that's a very encouraging sign. Um, but uh, I think that it would, it would be good to recognize, again, similarly to what the, uh, Mr. Ambassador commented on from uh, Ambassador Wittig, that there's a big gap between uh, what's being discussed and the rhetoric of what's being discussed at the international level and the actual execution and implementation on the ground. Uh, even as the international community has become seized and it's become suddenly um, uh, politically popular to comment about what's going on to help stop Joseph Kony, and there's media attention in a way that there never was before, there's a real danger that that will be confused with things that actually work, that that, that will be confused with things that are actually doing something on the ground. And so uh, to make sure that, that this discussion results in, in actual concrete results, I just want to highlight uh, three challenges uh, this morning. Um, uh, that, that I think will need to be addressed by the UN and member states uh, if these efforts are actually going to work where uh, it should be noted they have failed for more than two decades. Um, so uh, the first one is, is on the political side. Um, uh, as I said, cooperation amongst governments in the region uh, uh, to help address the LRA threat is not something that's at the top of any of their agendas. And in fact, other agendas often get in the way of exactly that kind of cooperation. Um, there's been um, a lot of hope invested in the AU initiative and the political leadership that the AU can offer in getting these governments in the region on the same page, but so far there haven't been any results from that. Um, specific examples, uh, uh, the latest reports indicate that Kony is hanging out right on the border areas between South Sudan and South Darfur um, with a group of LRA fighters. Um, the AU Special Envoy has indicated plans to travel to Khartoum and engage the Khartoum government, um, but uh, has not been allowed to do so yet. Uh, and we have not seen any kind of aggressive statements from anybody in the international community uh, calling out the Khartoum government uh, for what is essentially, potentially, providing uh, uh, Kony, one of the world's most wanted war criminals, safe haven uh, uh, in their territory. Um, if anybody is providing Kony and, Kony and LRA uh, safe haven, that should be something that is of paramount concern and is, in fact, dealing with that is absolutely a precondition to solving this problem. Uh, that's the most egregious example, but you have similar challenges in, in the Congo where uh, government officials have tried to actively downplay the threat that the LRA poses to civilians, to deny 
deny the kinds of attacks and displacement that's been caused by LRA atrocities, um, and kicked out the UPDF, who had been doing uh, the primary uh, responsibility of, of pursuing LRA forces in the DRC. Those are the kinds of issues that, unless you have a baseline, an environment of political cooperation, an agreement amongst regional governments about the specific ways that they will uh, adhere to the strategy that's being released, not only on military cooperation, but on cooperation to, 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 to do the DDR piece, getting these LRA fighters to, to come out of the bush, um, uh, none, none of this will actually work. Um, so uh, I think when um, uh, uh, envoy, the AU envoy Madeira and uh, um, the UN uh, Central Africa Director Musa come and brief the Security Council later this month, it would be great to press them on these kinds of issues about how we are engaging uh, Khartoum and how regional governments are responding to their diplomatic initiatives uh, to get this underway. I think the UNGA uh, conference uh, uh, gathering in September would also provide a great opportunity to gather each of these regional governments and discuss these kinds of issues in regional cooperation. Um, the second big challenge is just resources, 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 resources. Um, uh, basic infrastructure is a key tool to help squeeze out the LRA's ability to operate uh, in these areas. Um, the attacks have been, uh, as the, um, uh, Ms. Kumar Swami, the, the, um, the Secretary General's report indicated attacks in, in Western Equatorial State and South Sudan uh, have uh, diminished much more quickly than those in, in Congo and Central African Republic. And while it might seem funny to talk about South Sudan as a, as a good example of where infrastructure and development uh, exist, in fact, compared to the areas of Congo and Central African Republic where the LRA is operating, that is the case. Um, there are much more passable roads, there is uh, mobile phone infrastructure, um, and with those things, basic tools, you en enable governments in the region to respond. You enable the flow of information to communities to warn them of LRA attacks. Building this kind of infrastructure is absolutely critical in areas of Congo and CAR where the LRA are operating. Uh, in addition to communications infrastructure and roads, you also need the basic infrastructure for communicating with the LRA, which is largely FM radio stations, uh, which currently only cover a tiny fraction of the areas where the LRA is operating. FM radio broadcasts have been the number one nonviolent tool to entice LRA abductees and fighters to defect. Uh, this reduces the LRA's capacity to commit atrocities against civilians and helps protect those populations. Um, but uh, not enough resources have been invested in this. So in the statement that comes out from the, the Security Council's uh, briefing uh, later this month, it would be great to call on member states uh, to make an aggressive plug for member states to declare what new resources they're going to be committing to help implement this strategy on the ground. Um, and then the last thing is the, on the military side. Um, the, the AU initiative, there's been a lot of discussion about this new 5,000 force, uh, a plan to go after the LRA. Um, and uh, I think that, that the vision or the ambition is, is a good one in terms of where this could head. But we have to acknowledge what's actually happening. Um, and the reality is that the AU initiative you know, has been centered not on a questioning of what's it going to take to solve this problem, uh, but a questioning of what can we get from regional governments to provide to help solve this problem, whether or not that's actually enough. Um, the 5,000 troops is, is, uh, is, is not real. It's a counting of all the troops that have already been dedicated to, to, to operate in these areas. Uh, the AU uh, has no plans at the moment to actually take over any kind of command and control functions, which again leaves it back to these regional governments who have not made a priority of engaging this issue proactively to be the ones who are, who are uh, uh, taking the primary responsibility. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, in addition to troop numbers, the Ugandans, I should also comment here, the Ugandans have pulled out the vast majority of their troops pursuing the LRA. So of those 5,000 that are being counted of all the regional governments, uh, only about 800 are, are UPDF forces deployed in the field, uh, a fraction of which are actually pursuing the LRA at any given time. Um, so diplomatic pressure on these governments to be dedicating trained uh, and forces and adequate numbers to help protect civilians and pursue LRA groups. Active pursuit is, the, is the, the most important military tool. Without that active pursuit, LRA can abduct uh, at will and have the capacity to then retain those abductees and train them over time. Uh, you need to have an active pursuit function. Um, in addition, you need international resources, uh, particularly intelligence support and mobility lift um, uh, to support those operations. And so far, the US uh, has been the only international donor who's willing to put forward the actual resources uh, to help with that. So those are the three challenges I think um, uh, that the UN can be looking at uh, in the June briefing and, and uh, uh, in the follow-up steps to make sure that these uh, um, measures become reality. And as uh, Grace discussed, so we can finally see uh, this problem solved and so we can move into the era when we're talking about the challenges faced in helping rebuild these communities that have been devastated by the LRA for so long. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Mike, you, thank you for laying out those challenges so clearly and so specifically. I now turn with great pleasure to my old colleague, Adonia Ayabari, now the Deputy Permanent Representative of Uganda to the United Nations. Um, thank you, Warren, for um, uh, chairing the meeting and having me here. It's always back to, it's always good to be back at IPI. And uh, I thank your colleagues for putting this together. I have an idea of what it takes to uh, put together such an event, and uh, thank you for having us here. Um, let me thank Ambassador Whiting for your work uh, on this issue of uh, LRA and, and, uh, and your committee for doing a fantastic work, and my delegation uh, fully supports your efforts and will always cooperate with you. Um, uh, let me turn to, and I'm always proud to call her my sister, uh, uh, Kamara San here. She's, uh, since work start, she started her work in 2008, she has really uh, turned the whole uh, approach around in uh, dealing with uh, uh, children as they relate to LRA atrocities. And uh, twice in my career, I've worked with her. Since she came in 2006, I was at the mission, left, came back and found her still doing the same work. And her relationship with us has been uh, uh, really excellent. Uh, not that it, ha it is devoid of tension, but it is always creative tension <laughs> to do the right thing. Um, uh, and, and we always find a way of, of working together compared to her predecessor, whom we had real serious problems and the whole issue became politicized and, uh, and uh, there was no movement. And my compatriot, Grace, uh, thank you and uh, uh, really listening to you as a Ugandan, you know, uh, uh, takes me back into the bad days and really places the challenge to all of us to solve the problem. And Mike also, uh, you make me uh, really uh, jealous, you know, you can speak your mind, <laughs> which I can do these days. Eh? <laughs> um, um, basically, uh, my presentation will be very, very short. I will, uh, I will, uh, I will say that uh, my government is for 20 so years has been fighting the LRA, both militarily, politically, and diplomatically. Uh, and uh, we've looked at this issue not only from a, uh, a military point of view, but also from the political point of view and diplomatic point of view. As everybody is aware, you know, there was criticism years ago that the government was only taking a military approach, but the government unconditionally opened up for dialogue with the LRA, the so-called Juba peace process. An agreement was negotiated with the LRA. It has never been signed by the LRA. So, and we always insist that that political solution the door is still open for the LRA to come in and sign and implement the agreement. And, and we'll always, you know, we'll always um, uh, uh, look forward to that the day they sign. Then there is an issue which was raised by the speakers, especially uh, uh, Kamara Sani, about uh, the issue of, of amnesty. The issue of amnesty is another issue that has been out there. When essentially the government uh, passed the Amnesty Act was to encourage the low ranking LRA especially abducted children and those that really wanted to surrender to come up and surrender. Uh, but this law has since expired and we are not intending to renew it. We are only renewing the aspects that deal with integration uh, and resettlement of, of children and, and, um, and other abducted combatants. So whoever now surrenders or is captured among the LRA leadership will face the law in Uganda. And those ones that uh, and again, in my career with, uh, with, uh, with my country's foreign service, we've been dealing with the issue of the LRA, the justice, especially bringing the LRA to international justice. My government, of course, was the first government to refer the LRA to the International Criminal Court, and we still support that. And we hope that one of them will face international justice one day, preferably on himself. Uh, but the others that are not indicted by the ICC will also face law. And we have a war uh, crime division in the Ugandan High Court. And one of our recent prizes, which is Acheram, who has been captured, will face that court, the full weight of that court. So, so the issue of, uh, of amnesty as impunity doesn't arise in, in our opinion. Um, then I will also touch on the issue uh, of the AU-led regional cooperation initiative against the road resistance. I mean, I think to me that is, has been a paradigm shift. 
Uh, in the past, it was the Ugandan government fighting the LRA alone. Uh, now a decision was taken at the regional level to involve the AU, and I think that is significant. And, it, it, and I think the center of attention should shift from the Ugandan government to the AU uh, in terms of the political initiatives and diplomatic initiatives. We have subjected our uh, military approach and our political initiatives and diplomatic initiatives to the AU. We have really sort of handed all this to the AU-led um, uh, uh, regional initiative. Uh, and I think that's the best approach. Now for the first time, of course, when the LRA crossed the border from Uganda entirely, uh, our army pursued it to uh, initially Southern Sudan, um, then DRC, then the Central African Republic. And that was, compli was complicated in terms of our army crossing borders, sovereign borders. Of course, we've received great cooperation from the three governments. But now I think uh, looking at sustainability, an AU-led regional initiative will be more sustainable and more, you know, and the issues of transparency will be clear on, on the, uh, Michael talked about uh, the chain of command. I think those are the issues that are being discussed and to, to us, they are working. And uh, the diplomatic uh, uh, initiatives and uh, uh, the special representative, uh, uh, Francisco Mandera, who is very open-minded, doing a good job, of course, working with the UN, Abu Musa. And I think we should resist the danger of, of, uh, of trying to dilute that and internationalizing it. It, it. it can cause problems. And it will be in the context of the, in the, context of the AU UN relationship, peace and security cooperation. And it's not only peace and security issue, it's also DDR and development of that, those, those uh, the regions in those three countries which are not really developed infrastructure wise, you know, social programs, it should be a comprehensive regional approach that is supported by the international community. In our experience that the international community support will be very, very key, uh, but should not uh, take the lead. We should not go into the game of competition between the, either the UN or the AU, because that risks the, uh, the whole initiative unraveling. Um, and of course, on the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, child protection, and I, I can't agree with you more. I think we need to do more. And uh, uh, Kamarasani here has really developed uh, her working relationship with uh, our government to some extent. She doesn't even need the, the, the mission. She has signed operation guidelines with our army directly, her office. And, and I think those are the, the initiatives that we should make them work. And, uh, and uh, some of the issues are difficult. You know, you are talking about people who have been waging war, you know, against not only our government, but the regional governments. Uh, we can improve cooperation, timely cooperation in terms of handing over those children to, to uh, children protection officers. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think in the spirit of cooperation, that will, will, will work. Um, I will basically, you know, end here and I will entertain questions if there are any. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adonio. We're going to go to the floor now, but I'm going to start by calling on somebody who um, I did this by prearrangement, uh, and that's Pernil Ironside, who is here from UNICEF. And Pernil, I wanted to add something uh, to calling upon you. Uh, Radhika Kumaraswamy mentioned at one point uh, when she was talking about reintegration, and she mentioned UNICEF's involvement there. Um, and uh, can you tell us, in the course of asking a question or making a comment, could you give us a bit of an update on how reintegration is proceeding? I'll just perch, perch here <laughs> um, from in the corner. Of course, the, the issue of children having been infected by the LRA is not new, as you've all mentioned. It is, it's been going on for decades. And equally, the response and efforts of child protection actors have been um, ongoing for, for pretty much that entire time local grassroots organizations, faith-based organizations, um, uh, community organizations working hand-in-hand -hand with international NGOs such as COPI, who was mentioned, such as others, and certainly supported by and in partnership with UNICEF as well. Um, so what's new in this equation is really the cross-border dimensions and how we approach uh, the issues in a, in a much more um, strategic and 
um, coordinated manner that, that ultimately has greater impact for children. Um, and that's what we've been endeavoring to do um, as UNICEF working closely with the office of Madam Kumaraswamy, working with DPKO in South Sudan and in the, the Congo and with DPA in Central African Republic in establishing this child protection focal point system where essentially we are um, we now have a network that's established in those four countries that's coordinated by a, a lead coordinator in Kampala within UNICEF's offices and, and who is um, enhancing the um, uh, efforts on multiple levels. I'll just highlight um, two in particular. Uh, the first is on the on the um, analysis and gathering and in information sharing on a real time basis. So now our colleagues are much more closely in touch on a in sometimes on a daily basis where there's changes in the situation. Secondly, it's it's on the response side. All of these efforts were have been complicated by the fact that children from one nationality are turning up in in other countries, and um, you know, in, literally in the middle of nowhere, and um, and yet they need support not only to get back home across borders and across dangerous territory, but they also need that long-term care and support um, that is extremely complicated given the the experiences that they've undergone in no matter how short some of their times may have been with the LRA the modus operandi is um, the same in in terms of the long-term impact that their experiences have had on them emotional physical spiritual um, impact um, so what I'd like to just maybe draw to your attention is, it's come out a little bit already, but working in these environments where there is so little infrastructure as, um, and there are very few partners who have the skills and capacities to address these complex issues um, requires um, significant investment and energy um, and dedicated attention. It is not easy when two children escape from the LRA through a harrowing experience and turn up in the outskirts of Oboe, uh, and then there are no very few service providers in that location, and they require health care, they require um, extensive psychosocial support, transporting them to uh, an alternative location, ensuring that they have the, the, the structures in place around them for their transition home is, a, is um, not, it's not an attractive prospect for all donors who want to see large programs at scale. And yet these, as has been mentioned, these are children who have suffered some of the most brutal experiences imaginable. Um, so I, I just put that out to, to the group in terms of reflecting on um, the strategies that need to take um, be taken into account and where this group can really influence and make sure that regardless of the political and military efforts that are being put in place, that it's the child who inspires those decisions and inspires um, the strategic choices that need to be made and, um, and is, is really what's driving this agenda um, throughout. So thank you very much thank for you, the Pernille. opportunity. Um, if you just raise your hand, uh, I'll take a couple at once. Uh, in the front row first and then second and then third. And if you all would wait, panelists, for the three questions, we'll answer them all together. The first is right is Evelyn. Evelyn. Okay, first is Evelyn. I remember the St. Mary's experience, um, and I remember all the people who wrote about it. Were, I, Evelyn, introduce yes, yourself. Sir. I'm sorry. Evelyn Leopold, longtime journalist at the United Nations. Um, I am, 
I'm curious, did not the sisters rescue most of the abductees? Were you one of those who was not rescued? And secondly, very little was done at the time at the UN or elsewhere about the Sudan because Uganda was harboring SPLM guerrillas and so the Sudan was arming uh, the LRA. And, um, and they were on fertile ground because the region there was not treated very well by Museveni. And, it, and I'm just curious if that has improved after the camps. And also your experience, were you one of those who were not rescued right away from St. Mary's? Excellent, would you just hold on that? The second one there. I'm uh, Karen Colvard from the Harry Guggenheim Foundation. There's always been a paradox when talking about rescue and rehabilitation or talking about uh, punishment versus impunity in deciding who is a child, how many years in the bush, or how many killings does somebody uh, commit before we're, uh, we reclassify them. Uh, Donia mentioned the uh, recent thinking in the Ugandan government about uh, amnesties, uh, the end of amnesty, and the uh, co coinciding with the recent capture of this uh, fellow the UDPF picked up recently, who I understand was abducted as, as a child and has been in the uh, LRA ever since. Uh, if not him, many, many other people must have. I, my question is particularly directed to Mrs. Kumaraswamy. Just uh, understand, I'd like to know how you negotiate that gray area. Do you have a diagnostic that you can generalize on about when a child soldier becomes a warrior? Thank you. And, and then our last question, very good. Um, hi, my name is Sarah Weschler. I'm with a small Ugandan organization um, in Gulu called Information for Youth Empowerment Program. I just thought I, there seemed to be a consensus among the panel that the lapsing of the amnesty was a good thing. And uh, I just kind of wanted to interrogate that a little bit because uh, it's indisputable that thousands of mid-level officers in the LRA over the last 10 years came back precisely because of the amnesty, precisely because it was so clear cut that if you are not part of the top five, you can come home and it will be okay, which has in any way been undermined by the Coyello case. But the point is, don't, even though there's not that many Ugandans left in the LRA, don't, we think that, don't you think that this will have a bad effect on defection now that this is not as clear cut a, a question anymore of the safety of defecting and coming home? Uh, thank you very much. So we have those questions. I'm going to ask the panelists to pick and choose among them. But Grace, I'm going to turn to you first because Evelyn Leopold actually asked you specific questions about your own experience. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, it seems like you already know a lot more what happened at St. Mary's than... Um, in 1996, let's say from 1995, 1996 to, 90, to 2004, the LRA were abducting children in large numbers. And they were abducting children from schools and from farms, from everywhere that the children are gathered. They are brutal... Um, treatment of the children and the people in northern Uganda at that time was very, very serious, even including uh, cooking teachers and making the children to eat it before they take the, teacher, uh, take the children away. In St. Mary's 1996, when they abducted us, we were 139. Sister Raquel, who is my hero, nobody actually knows that as a hero, she followed these rebels on her own because she loved us and begged Lagira to uh, uh, release, the commander Lagira at that time, to release the, the girls. She sacrificed her life, say, why don't you kill me and let the girls go? Or take me, let me go talk to Con and let my girls go. At the end of it, because of her persistence, crying, removing even the veil, because the Catholic veil, um, the Kombondi sisters, is very important. She removed the veil. She had no shoes in her leg, walking with us all day. At the end, she was given 109 girls. But unfortunately, I was part of the 30 girls who were left, um, left with the LRA. And the support of Sudan at that time was very strong, that the LRA were very free in southern Sudan to move wherever they wanted. 
We were sent to fight the SPLA, the Sudan People's Liberation Army. We were sent to fight the, uh, the civilians in southern Sudan, and nobody could lift a finger because they, they had a full support of the, the, of the Sudan, uh, South, uh, um, northern Sudan government. And so Sister Akele, to my own understanding, she's a hero. She was the first to go to meet uh, Nelson Mandela at that time. She met um, Kofi Annan. She went to my president's office. Um, I don't know whether uh, Mr. Uh, Ayebear was there at that time. Every week, every day, sister was at the president's office crying for her children. At some point, the, the president gave her the chopper to go to um, Kenya, and we thought maybe she was even dead because she wanted to rescue the girl. She persisted. At the end of it, the Pope had to recall her back because I don't think she would survive that long because she was really persistent. Thank you, Grace. Uh, Rodica, I think one question was yes. directed at you. Thank you for that. Well, of course, this is a dilemma that one faces, that if one is recruited as a child soldier and then uh, continues to be a soldier, rise up in the command, and then you actually become a commander yourself as an adult, whether you're still liable for uh, your actions or should be treated as a child soldier. I think the humanitarians in this uh, would like uh, would like to give the benefit of the doubt to the child and allow to say that this is once a child has been committed there in this process and therefore they should not be held accountable. But I think the lawyers uh, have, I think, made the law, which is that uh, I think they are liable for the crimes they commit after they're 18. Uh, so that's how it's worked it out. Uh, and on, on amnesty, would you speak about that, Adonia? Yeah, on amnesty and um, and also the support of Uganda to the SPRM, uh, I would like to make a comment. Um, I, I, you know, for all my sins, I was also a journalist. And, and, and what we tend to do is to ignore history. You know, the NRM government of President Museven came into power in 1986. SPRM was formed in 1983. It was not because Uganda was supporting SPRM that Khartoum supported the NRA. They immediately, the current government went into power, even before support, our active support to the SPRM, Khartoum started supporting NRA. So it's, it's, it was not the question, you know, it's, it's a sound bite, it's good, but it was not a question of, you know, tit for tat. It's more complicated, uh, more complicated than that. On the amnesty, I think it's a very good question and it's a, it's, 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 it's a dilemma. But, you know, if there are genuine cases out there, there are still laws in Uganda, you know, pardon, you know, the president can literally pardon anybody according to our law if there is a genuine you know, case, you know, that somebody was abducted and now they are willing to report back and renounce war. Um, but the problem with the amnesty law is that it was really, it was like, it was, it had to end, you know. It was being taken advantage of by all sorts of people and, you know, people say, I can stay fighting now, the law is there, I can always come back next year. Now that there is a cutoff, I think it will also be a pressure that, you know, and few of them really, you know, estimate it's the hard cause that are remaining. And a few Ugandans now remaining in the LRA. Uh, so we'll, again, if there is a case, we'll review it as, as it comes out. And Michael? Yeah, just a couple quick comments. Um, I, I, I guess I would say I would agree with you that, that uh, unequivocally that the, the way that the Amnesty Act was allowed to lapse uh, was very damaging uh, to efforts to, to help uh, stop LRA atrocities. Uh, Amnesty has been an incredibly and continues to be an incredibly useful tool. Um, when they do these broadcasts from FM radio stations uh, in Congo, in South Sudan, and Central African Republic, the message that any abductee who braves the threat of death um, uh, to try to escape from the LRA is going to be able to return uh, to their homes without fearing that they're going to be prosecuted in addition to the other host of challenges that they'll face in trying to reintegrate into their communities uh, is a huge incentive. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to say that, that, you know, I'm not going to comment on whether or not amnesty is a good thing or a bad thing in the context of transitional justice, but I would say that ambiguity is the worst possible thing. 
And that's what, what went wrong in the way that the government indicated plans to renew the Amnesty Act all the way up until the point when they decided last minute to not renew the Amnesty Act, or the amnesty provision, at least, of the Amnesty Act. Um, and I think that what that risks is a situation where, one, justice gets politicized, and it's up to the Ugandan government, oh, do we prosecute this one or not? And two, you don't have a very clear and precise message to the Bush to say, you know, these three people are going to be prosecuted. The rest of you come home, and you'll be safe. Oh, very good. Uh, we'll take one here, then Jeffrey Laurenti, and here in the front row. Thank you. One, two, three. Once again, panel, if you just would listen to the three questions, and we'll answer them all together. I've had no experience about Uganda. But, but start by introducing yourself, please. Uh, my name is Shirley Chesney from the NGO Committee on Disarmament, Peace, and Security. But in the case of Liberia and Sierra Leone, and after the Rwanda genocide, uh, an uh, Irish organization called Concern, and the women who stood out to try to end the war, who were called mothers of Liberia that were successful, were very despaired because while they was plans and reports to integrate the children, no resources were allocated to the families who had suffered the loss there was widespread unemployment and total destruction of communities. As you said, the infrastructure wasn't there. So does this report by the Secretary General propose some kind of new fund or massive effort to integrate all the different uh, UN agencies that may be involved and the African Union, but by themselves do not have the resources to really solve the problem. Thank you. Jeff? I'm going to ask you to answer yeah. that. Uh, Jeff Laurenti with the Century Foundation. I wonder if you all could give us a sense of the nature of the Lord's Resistance Army at this point in time. Is it essentially like a barbarian tribe that is uh, wandering, living off the land, foraging, with no, or without any kind of either ethnic or other attachment to wherever it may happen to be, just a coerced body of servants uh, coming along. What's its revenue basis at this point under the, the pressures it's feeling? What kind of command structure does it still have? And then jumping from that, Obama's rather startling decision, given Washington's total indifference to anything going on in Washington, uh, excuse me, in Africa, to send 100 uh, US military personnel what role are they playing? How effective is that particular addition to the efforts uh, that are made to finally crack uh, the LRA? Uh, is this a time for drones? In the front row. I'm going to ask you that. Uh, Eddie Mandrew with Global Kids. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, my question is also connected to the last about the militarism. Uh, the militaristic solution. In 2008, December, there was the Garamba Offensive, uh, where there was a push to go and uh, capture uh, Joseph Kony. For the most part, based on my understanding of the results, it was a failure. Uh, so is there room for political solution? I mean, everyone seems to be pushing a coordinated military response. Uh, what are the options on the political front? Great. I'm going to ask uh, Radhika Kumaraswamy to speak, first of all, about the report. Yes, well, the report has a strong call to donors uh, to support the reintegration efforts. For the UN, of course, UNICEF is in the lead with re regard to this reintegration, but it's, it's, it's the whole uh, uh, protection cluster that's involved I'm ga in this reintegration. Uh, so it really, we, would, we are trying, both myself as well as the UNICEF uh, uh, executive director and others to raise funding for this uh, reintegration programs uh, so that they can go ahead uh, on the ground. So the report has a real call for that uh, donor funding of those UNICEF programs. But with regard to the militarization, if I may make a comment, is is in, in a sense that um, in a sense that I think uh, uh, it's Mr. Coney who refused in the last round of political negotiations to to pursue that political solution. Uh, and then we, one cannot allow him to then 
rove around uh, uh, having these exactions. So there has to be a military response. But what we're saying is that in this kind of military response, that the, those troops that are engaging in that must be trained in protection of civilians and, and, and protection of children. Um, the, the status of the LRA, uh, which several panelists have called, uh, I think Radha Kumaraswamy said, now in survival mode. Uh, Michael, you may have said it's, it's collapsing, basically. It's just, it's shattered. Um, it is just in the business now of sort of keeping itself alive. Um, Grace, do you feel um, qualified from your experience to answer that question? What is the, the this um, obviously defensive postured LRA now? Do they still represent a terrible threat? Um, <clears throat> to me, I don't think LRA is uh, strong right now because even given the fact that um, the recent capture of the top commander, the third in command, and it was captured without, um, without escort. That's what I kept wondering. They captured him only with the, the, the girl that he was using as his wife and a child who was like a, um, a babysitter to, um, to the wife. Uh, and he was alone. That is if Mr. Adunay can um, really clarify that. That is never happened. The LRA top commander moves with the escorts, either two or three of them, carrying either his guns or his property or his um, personal stuff. So they move with the group. If there's no other group that is more than 10, at least there would be uh, escorts with the commander, in, uh, top commander. But he was captured alone. That indicates either he was trying to, to defect or the LRA actually have really, really um, weakened that they cannot even have uh, um, escort. And to your question about the militarism, I just want to add that the, the LRA, first of all, uh, Kony himself knows what he has done. He knows that he has committed great atrocities. For the Joseph Kony, even the, the peace talk in 19, uh, Six, I knew from the very start that he was going to fail because this guy knows what he has done. He knows what he has done to his own people. He knows what he has done, he's doing in, uh, in Congo. And he knows that if he goes and he signs the agreement and comes out, it's not going to be easy for him. So even uh, saying giving a political um, ground for him to come to the table, it's just um, a waste of time to me. <laughs> Because it's not like somebody who is fighting to come and take over the government now. It's just fighting for survival. It's just abducting children for survival. If I have answered it. Do you want to speak? Yeah. Please. Um, yeah, I'm not going on the political solution. I think uh, the two sisters have answered it. Um, I'll just talk on the, US, on the U.S.'s role. Um, um, I think that we should again have context on this. I think for 20 years, um, our government especially, and uh, the Southern Sudan, then SPRM, have single-handedly fought the LRA, you know, out of Uganda and now into the region. I think the challenge now where the US has filled in the gap is intelligence gathering. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I think that's, that's where the focus is now that the LRA is out of Uganda. That, you know, where we were able to fight them now, it, it's a very wide area. You know, intelligence assets of, of the U.S. Are very, are very, very welcome. But drones, drones I think they are not welcome. <laughs> it's, it, that's another, another kind of thing. And, uh, and I think myself, I'm uncomfortable with militarism. I think the LRA is a unique situation whereby, you know, all options have been tried. Uh, and I think I agree with Grace that LRA now is, you know, is spread into small groups in survival mode. I think our indication is that actual HRM was not captured alone. He had, he had bodyguards. He, he attempted to fight. There was an attempt to fight. You know, of course he saw he was overpowered, you know. And we had accurate intelligence where he was coming from, where he was going. Uh, you know, he was basically neutralized. And I think he was still in touch with Cony. 
And Michael, you just have a moment, then I want to go to a couple more questions. Just a quick comment on the advisors. Um, yeah, they're only a part of the, of the solution, but one thing that we think that their presence can help with because of their function in terms of the intelligence and analysis um, is actually kind of bridging this kind of military versus political gap and looking at because the LRA is so dispersed and in so many small groups, how do you actually tailor responses to very specific commanders and specific groups based on where they're located, the histories of those commanders, how brutal they are, whether you can get their family members on the radio, uh, what members of their groups have defected. You know, you can develop a strategy that includes both military pursuit and outreach directly to try to peel off members of the group. And I think that's going to be the most effective way to get it done. Very good. Time for one more question or two. I have one in the front row and, and one in the back row. That'll do it. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Ivo Richard Fung. I'm the director of the United Nations Regional Center for Peace and Disarmament in Africa. But right now, I'm a visiting fellow with IPI. <laughs> My office there with uh, LRA, uh, largely looking at the problem from the transborder flow of weapons in the region, as we do in many parts of Africa. Uh, I'm going to tilt my comment, it's not a question, uh, towards the aspect of beyond CONI, to look at the preventive side of things. Because if you look at why is this happening, it's happening because basically of two things. One is the absence of the state in many parts of the region in the country. Because the state is not present in many parts of the country, the state cannot control the territory as effectively as it should because of all the reasons we know, including resources and so on and so forth. One is the problem of governance. You know until we address the issues of governance in our countries in a manner that people will not be disgruntled and sought to other means of uh, you know, arguing on the space that they need to occupy in the, uh, in the whole governance issue, we will not be able to make uh, progress. And this is an aspect now we're working, my office is working with the UN Office for Central Africa, we're trying to look at these two aspects, how these countries, uh, Central African Republic, Uganda, Northeast of uh, uh, DRC, uh, Southern Sudan, etc., how we can build into the preventive uh, as uh, aspect the issue of strengthening governance and strengthening the state capacity to be able not just to control the borders, but also to be present all over the territory. And when we're talking of being present, it's not necessarily having people everywhere, but being able to have either custom posts, police posts, etc., where they should be, so that these kind of things are no longer there. So beyond Kony, this are, is a contribution on the kinds of things we should be looking at. Thank you. Ivor, thank you very much. And in the back row. Yes. Uh, David Donatkaten with the Parliamentarians for Global Action. If I'm allowed to make a brief comment on legal uh, matters up, upon the question made by the uh, person from the Guggenheim Foundation. Uh, the children who were abducted are enslaved, as Madame Okello told us. If you read the uh, indictment against Connie of 2005 from the ICC, the main crime against humanity for which he's indicted is the crime of enslavement. When a child turns adult and is still enslaved, it means that somebody else is exercising property rights over the adult. So the adult has not the required mens rea, the required mental element, the intent and knowledge of the consequences of his acts and his crimes. So therefore, that person should be legally not considered the responsible guilty person for the crimes because he's simply an instrumentum criminis, a tool in the hands of another person, which is Connie, who is the person individually criminally responsible for the crime. So these children or former children, A, should not be prosecuted. And I think Mr. Butera, the director for public prosecutions, already said it in, in Uganda, upon expiration of the Amnesty Act, that he's not going to prosecute all the children and former children, first. Second, those 
former children, they don't need to have any amnesty for whatever crime because they did not commit the crime. They committed the crime as tools in the hands of another individual. So from a strictly legal point of view, Article 30 of the Rome Statute applies, international law applies, and uh, those children or those former children, if they are prosecuted, should defend themselves by saying, yes, we did what we did because we were completely manipulated. We didn't have any moral choice. We were under duress. Somebody else should be the culprit, and that person is Connie or other leaders of the LRA. So I really believe that we should uh, bear in mind that the legal parameters are very clear, and this amnesty, this revocation of the amnesty, this blanket amnesty, which is unacceptable un under international law, does not at all change the terms of reference for the former uh, children to come out of the bush and reintegrate in society through the, in society through the programs that have been um, uh, explained here at been presented today. What we need now is uh, special forces with the training to go and just arrest. We need arrest operation. We don't need e executions or, or aerial bombings or uh, like lighting thunder 2008. We need something very precise mm -hmm. uh, and, and very skilled forces like the ones who arrested Fodai Sanko in Sierra Leone and the, and the wars uh, ended there or those who arrested uh, Bagbo in Cote d'Ivoire. This type of forces we need, not others. Uh, thank you very much for that comment. We have a minute more. Uh, Radhika Kumaraswamy will address it. And then, panelists, uh, if you have anything additional you'd like to say, now's the time to say it. Well, let me just begin by saying that I've had conversations with ICC on this issue. And it is the view of the prosecutor's office that, that after 18, uh, they bear responsibility. So I, I don't know. Uh, I agree with you, though. I must say, I personally agree with you that that should be. But I think it's about this individual, Dominique, whom you may have heard in the LRA, who has committed the most horrendous crimes uh, in the car, et cetera. And he was a former child soldier. And they feel they should indict him, I think. Uh, so I think that is, the, that is the case there. And finally, just with regard to amnesty as well, I mean, those who bear the greatest responsibility cannot get amnesty for this, the horrific crimes uh, that have been that have taken place. But the problem is that some of them may have been former child soldiers. Maybe that consideration can be used in not giving them, uh, uh, prosecuting them. But those adults who have uh, committed these gravest crimes, my sense is that amnesty should not be given to them. Grace Ocalo, I'm happy to give you the final word. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I, I was just checking my head because uh, when we talk about child soldiers abduction, it's like we're talking about children who are abducted today and they escape tomorrow. But we are talking about children who are abducted as, at the age of seven and they spend a better, t a better part of their lives in captivity. They spend, my friend who was abducted in 1996, is still in captivity up to today, um, if you agree with me. Uh, Miriam Akelo is still with the LRA up to today, how old is she? When she comes back, she is, she'll be legible for prosecution because she's adult now, but she was abducted. And escape with the LRA, you have to know that it's very, very difficult. It's not something you just get up one day and say, I am just going to go even if you're adult. What about a child who was abducted at the age of seven, eight, nine, ten years and spends a better type of part of their life there? They have had nothing, nothing at all but what they are introduced to. Coin becomes their, their father. The leaders in the LRA becomes their, the, the image that they look into. So if we are thinking of prosecuting children who have turned adult, who have committed crimes there, we should look at the mental part of these children who are adult. Because they're not abducted as adult and they committed crimes as adult. They were abducted as children and even adult abducted as adult. Forced, if you, a gun is put into your head, wouldn't you do something for, for your survival? It's survival for the fittest. And so the courts and the laws and the legal institutions should look at that very carefully. Otherwise, we'll be prosecuting, uh, making injustice to the people who have suffered injustice for the rest of their lives. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Grace Sicalo, in particular, and thank the other panelists. I think this has been a, a very compelling panel on a subject that interests so many people. Uh, and thank you all for your attendance, and particularly for your attention and good questions.